The age has a lot to do with it because we, we know, so age and transplantation actually go hand in hand. So we know that patients who are younger, they have better outcomes with uh, stem cell transplantation. Uh, that's true for both the matched related and the matched unrelated setting. So patients up to the age of 20 do far better than those patients who are over the age of 40. So if you look at a survival curve, it's about, you know, matched sibling donor uh, up, to, uh, up to the age of 20 is about 80%. That number drops about 60, 65 between the ages 20 and 40. Uh, and the drops even more if you're over the age of 40. I mean, you're talking about a 50% overall survival. You know, so you're talking about survival of 80, about 60, 65 to 50. So this is a very linear, very correlative um, uh, aspect between age and stem cell transplantation, both in the match-related and in the unrelated uh, setting. So although advances have been made in, in transplant protocols and safety, the older patient is still a challenge. I mean, they're still having a lot of complications from transplantation. So the um, transplant have also evolved, obviously, not only uh, immunosuppressive uh, uh, therapy with the addition, for example, of a uh, l trauma pack, but there is still a, a, a drop of 10-20% uh, of patients who actually either die from transplant-related complications, uh, complications of uh, acute and chronic graft versus host disease, uh, and infections. So it's, uh, um, it, it decreases uh, with a younger age. These tend to be more tolerated, but they, they can be very limiting in, uh, in, in a non-malignant disease like aplastic anemia. Doing bone marrow transplantation or stem cell transplantation uh, in patients with aplastic anemia, it's something that evolved historically meaning that this was uh, a modality that was developed in the early 70s when transplantation was starting to become more feasible. Uh, Aplastic anemia, interesting, was one of the first diseases actually to benefit from stem cell transplantation because remember, in order for a, a stem cell transplantation to be successful in aplastic anemia, you just need to engraft and not die from the transplant or not have complications from the transplant. So you don't have to have a graft versus tumor effect or graft versus leukemia or graft versus myeloma. You just have to engraft. Uh, and if they don't have complications, uh, you're pretty much, uh, you know, have you know, uh, cured the disease. The issue is uh, that the only trial that compared transplantation with something else was with androgens in the 1970s. Uh, and there's been no trial comparing uh, immunosuppressive therapy with transplantation frontline. So historically, the transplantation uh, has been incorporated to treatment in algorithms. So if you're less than 20, for sure, if you have a match-related donor, transplantation should be offered given that the results long-term are pretty good and the increased tolerability of this treatment modality in the upper setting. Now, this is also extended to patients uh, between 20 and 40 years of age, given that although the risks are higher, it, it, they're, they're still acceptable. Uh, the issue becomes that of uh, unrelated bone marrow transplantation in the upfront setting. Now, if you look at the data and the results, uh, they look, especially in the very young patient population, very similar to that of the uh, uh, match-related donor. The problem is that um, it takes several months, actually, to find an unrelated donor, and this unrelated donor may not pan out, and now you're going to have somebody two, three, four months out, not getting any specific therapy uh, with complications and transfusions of, uh, complications of neutropenia and transfusions, increasing their burden. Um, and so that's very problematic when you have very effective therapy like in the, in the horse ATD cyclosporin that can, especially in children, is associated with an overall response rate of 75 to 80 percent and long-term survival of 90 percent. So that's really good. So I feel, um, I feel hesitant to uh, uh, recommend unrelated universally to all patients, not, not because of the data is not good, just because the complexity and the logistics uh, of putting this all together, uh, and patients actually might die waiting for unrelated donors. So that's not something that I think is too, uh, too good. I think if somebody's, I think it's uh, regardless of age. I mean, having somebody waiting 12 weeks or three months for an unrelated donor, uh, I think that's complicated. Uh, I mean, if you can do this in a month or two, I think that's okay. But you would have to be in a very selected patient populations. I mean, some patient populations are just very, heterogeneous. I mean, you look at some countries like Japan, that tends to be more homogeneous you know, in certain parts of Europe. But you look at other places, the structure and the logistics and the ability to find this unrelated donor, depending on even on your uh, ethnicity, can, can have a huge impact in finding a donor in the registry. So 
I think that's um, it's for really you know patients who can wait, patients who don't have complications of their disease, patients who can find a donor very quickly, who can then undergo all the pre-transplant evaluation and be admitted and have the transplant done in a very timely fashion. I think you're talking about a very small uh, group of, uh, of people. My concern is that uh, you do have very effective therapy that you can offer. Now, pro for, for me, the more logical and rational approach is to, if you don't have a related donor, you know, treat them. And in three months, you'll know if they responded or not to immunosuppressive therapy. By then, you'll know if you have a donor or not. So you can kind of go to transplant at that point if patients are not responding. Uh, but some centers can pull this off very quickly, and they tend to find unrelated donors also rather quickly. But again, it has to do with a lot of operational and logistical issues and genetic and ethnic uh, uh, backgrounds. So uh, I don't think you can just make this into a, a, a broad uh, uh, statement. I think it has to be very center-specific, country-specific, city-specific. Uh, in order to, to be confident to do that and, and, tr and try to recommend that. The results for alternative donors or a, a matched unrelated donors, they have improved over time, which is good, given the fact that we're better in supporting patients uh, with uh, uh, you know, blood banking and uh, antimicrobials, better conditioning regimens, better ways to diagnose infections and treat infections. So the results have actually gotten better with matched unrelated donors. Now, they have been preferentially used in patients who failed initial immunosuppressive therapy. And so for those patients who, who don't have a matched sibling donor are younger and do not respond to initial immunosuppressive therapy, that, well, that would be an option. But, uh, um, but you have to start the donor search early because you can't, you can't wait till the six month mark and say, oh, you didn't respond, so let's start looking for a donor. So that's not, that's not good either. So you may want to start in these younger patients or somebody who you think you might offer an unrelated donor a transplant, just start looking as you start treating them with immunosuppressive therapy because by the time you reach three and six months, you'll absolutely know if you have a donor, what kind of donor do you have, and you can start making those decisions. Um, this is a far more rational way of, of approaching this. Now, the haploidentical is something relatively new. Uh, it's being explored in several diseases, including in aplastic anemia. But if you look at the published literature with a more, more modern post-cyclophosphamide day three, four regimen, you only have a, you know, 20, 25 patients reported in the literature with limited follow-up. Uh, conditioning regimens are a little bit different. So we don't actually know uh, how beneficial um, this uh, treatment modality will be in rescuing patients with uh, severe aplastic anemia. Clearly there is a, a, an activity, you know, patients do, do benefit, uh, but it's, there's only very few patients that have been reported, and we don't have large prospective uh, studies. So it is an option to consider. Um, that this should be done in a context of a research protocol or an investigational protocol until we know, uh, until we know better. Uh, but this is, this is what should happen in the setting of haploidentical, not because it, it doesn't work, it doesn't have activity, it's just that we still have to understand more about it uh, before we embark in this treatment modality for patients like routinely, before we start recommending it.